Do we have closed captioning, Jimmy, at all? Or? Huh. I'll go ahead and just keep going through here. Using my one of my favorite tools here. It's not really a unitasker. It's a, Pecans, tomatoes here. Shut up, I'll talk to you later, not now. And uh, it's gonna be a little crumbly here, but that's all right. Be mixing our cheese and stuff here. Get a little bit more piece of here, so. Right. Meantime. They're pan hot. Got a picture of video over there from the phone. All right. it and yeah so it's almost business as usual it's just not inside the winery building 
Um, yeah, there are definitely fewer visitors right now, uh, which is unfortunate. Yeah. But uh, there's anybody who comes out gets lots of attention. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, there's a little map. So does that? So being out. Okay, so, <clears throat> all right, so I've made the apple thyme vinaigrette. Um, I mixed our our stuffing. Again, our stuffing in here, I'll take, show you here. It's got the sausage, uh, it has pecans, uh, pre-cooked sausage, let it cool down a little bit. Um, and I've got the sun-dried tomatoes in there, some parsley, uh, pecan. So um, set that aside here and we will uh, see about the chick breasts and really want a quick sear on these um, because we do not want to cook our chicken breasts all the way um, We want our chicken a little bit. So we're going to do a quick sear on these, on these guys. So on these chicken breasts here really quick. Throw those three there. All right, and the way I'm going to cut the pocket in these to stuff is a little bit different than I think, I think than a, a lot of different recipes. A lot of different recipes will have you kind of fillet the chicken breast open, kind of butterfly it, or go into the thickest part and you kind of stuff it in there. But we're actually going to create a pocket on the back side of the uh, chicken breast um, there and uh, that process there. So. Now what I'm going to do with the stuffing here while our chicken is, is searing here is I'm going to take about half of it out. Uh, we'll set that aside for a different use later on. We could, you know, we could toss it with some pasta later on or put it into some pork chops um, or uh, even scramble some eggs with this stuff. You know, that'd be pretty good. So I'm just going to um, take a little bit of this out. Because uh, once we start touching that raw chicken breast, we definitely don't want to put that raw chicken breast into our cooked stuffing there and throw out all that stuff, right? So, so we've got a pretty nice little sphere here. On these guys, a nice little golden brown here. All right, just let that go for about five seconds there. All right. And then we're off the heat. Okay, we just want that nice golden brown color. Well, that's our tape, man. Okay. So we're off the heat there. Okay, now we get into cutting our pockets. Bits. So this is uh, something uh, while well, working in a restaurant. It's kind of interesting, kind of fun. It's a different way to uh, stuff your chicken breast here. So um, what I'm going to do here with this. Okay, so here is here, here we have basically like the skin side, right? This is the side that the skin uh, would be on. And this side would be our ribs. This is the side that closes the rib cage. And that's the side we want to cut in. Okay, so we want to go from the top here, thickest part. We want to make about, about a three inch incision here. Okay, three, inch, three inches long. Only about Every inch down into the breast. Just kind of cut it open. All right, open. quick audio test. Okay, then I'm going to take my knife and I'm going to lay it perpendicular to the chicken breast. All right, I'm going to go inside of that cut there and I'm going to cut kind of inside of that pocket. Now we've kind of created the pocket there. Okay, then I Excuse me, I flip the chicken breast. So, okay, I make another incision like I did on other side there. All right, now we've got a, have another little pocket. And we just continue that same pocket into the thickest part, thickest part here of the chicken breast. 
All right, and this cigarette's kind of falling apart a little bit on it. Okay. The food, it always, you just have to adapt to it there. So now we take our stuffing here. All right, and kind of press it into our chicken breast here. Like so. A little more cheese in there. Good thing about having crumbled sausage and the crumbled cheese, you kind of pick out the bigger cheese here. Throw that in there. Right. Yeah, so, you know, when I first saw the recipe and, you know, the gorgonzola and sausage were the two main ingredients jumping out at me, that um, totally made me think of sparkling wine. I think with sparkling wine, anything uh, with fat and salt is a perfect pairing. Uh, sparkling wine has the acidity and the crispness and the fruit. And I mean, honestly, one of the best pairings uh, for sparkling wine is actually fried chicken. And oh. it's, yeah, it's, it's beautiful together. Um, but again, it's something fatty, salty. I mean, another favorite of mine would simply be Cheez-Its uh, for the same reason. <laughs> the, the salt and the fat, the tanginess of the cheese, it just works incredibly well uh, with sparkling wine. So yeah, that's what I'm drinking right now is my Brut. It is a blend of <laughs> Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. It's about 50-50. It's um, completely dry. It's, uh, it's, well, it's a Brut um, refers to the level of sweetness. And this is six grams of, of uh, sugar in the dosage at six grams per liter. So that's what gives it this Brut classification. And, uh, you know, a sweeter sparkling wine, I, I don't, think you would enjoy these these full rich flavors as much that you're going to get from this stuffing in this dish so um the other wine for a red wine i think the best pairing would be pinot noir it just so happens those are the two wines that i make <laughs> um but pinot, pinot noir again um because it's got the fruit it's got the acidity and that um that enables it to pair well um, the fruit with a lighter meat, such as chicken, pork, dishes like that. Um, but then again, the richness and the earthiness from the sausage and that gorgonzola are going to be a really, really great pairing. So I wish I had some of that here. Yeah. I know, I wish we could have got a trade of some sort before we got this set up. <laughs> Good. Let me just dump this out here really quick. Yeah. All right. So here I've got my three chicken breasts stuffed here. So you know, just kind of created this pocket on the back side. All right. And then as that bakes, it'll wrap around that that stuff right there. All right. And let's go ahead and. Pop these guys in the oven, and we'll get going on our on our uh, creamy polenta greens over here. So, um, all right. So, so the cream, so the uh, polenta that I'm doing uh, is a creamy corn polenta, right? Um, let's do that cream here in a second. I'm gonna go ahead and get the uh, chicken stock going here. We're out, uh, Hey Jason, real quick question for you from uh, from Kathy. Um, yeah. Is the ch chicken breast still raw inside when you make the pocket? Yes. yes. Okay. So yeah, you do want to watch out for that, and you will want to clean your knife and everything afterwards as well. Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to take. Uh, Things of butter here, cut into our pan. I've got about a shallot down here. Put that in there as well. All right. Turn that around. All right. So this is the sauce that you're making for the chicken, right? 
Uh, no, this is actually the uh, creamy polenta that I'm making for the chicken. Um, that sauce, sauce was the uh, uh, was the green apple thyme vinaigrette. Um, but then to the polenta, what I'm going to add is a the kind of a, a corn cream. So what I've done is I've taken corn and shallot and I cooked them in in uh, a heavy cream. And actually, I put the corn cob in there as well. The corn cob still has a little bit of that corn milk, if you will, in there. Um, so I added that in there. We're going to blend that up here. So here I've got one cup of polenta and two and a half cups of chicken stock. So we'll go ahead and dump that in and we'll bring that up. Let this guy over here. All right, so now I'll take out our corn cobs here. We don't need those guys anymore. All right, and then I'll throw this into our, into our here, here really quick. Okay, back in the blender. There we go, scrape all that down there. And our plant is already yellow or green is pretty pretty yellow so um corn it'll add a nice rich yellow color to it so let's blend all this up you don't have to blend it till it's smooth we can have it somewhat chunky okay, you can like a little bit of texture with that right <laughs> so blend that up a little bit that Vitamix, nice and loud, and I think, I think everybody can hear us now. Yay, so now we've got our nice little yellow corn cream here, and uh, you can really use this for a lot of things. You can finish risotto with it, you could throw it in with some um, some uh, long grain rice, or even basmati rice and some asparagus or something. Uh, corn has a lot of different really Kind of a cool little thing to have to make up. Um, hold on one second. I'm washing out a pan over here. Give me one second here. And have that there. Again, we kind of have kind of a rich dish here with this. You know, we've got that. We've got the heavy cream in there, and then we've got the polenta, and we've got the sausage, and the cheese. But all this. Uh, Nice, good complementary good flavors, little. though. I like how the, uh, you know, the the sweetness of the corn, and then the saltiness from the sausage, and that fattiness, um, and then like like you were saying, Diana, the using that uh, sparkling wine to kind of cut through that and kind of brighten everything up. Right. I don't know if everybody got it or not, but I'll explain this green apple vinaigrette again. But, um, whoop. But again, I just it was a shallot, a garlic. Uh, mustard, uh, rice wine vinegar, cider vinegar, green apple, bacon, thyme, um, puree all that up, so we uh, drizzling oil there, and we get this, we get this kind of really nice green liquid here. We can spoon on the top of our, our chicken, so we're gonna have a lot of color, which you know we'll have we'll have the sun dried parsley, the white from the gorgonzola, the yellow from the corn polenta, you know, and it's green on top. So we'll have, have quite a bit of uh, color on this guy here. So I love using this little wood board here. <laughs> um, should have picked up some plates from campus last week. We got in a bunch of new plates. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got some new plates for us to use uh, when we get back to campus, when we do some of our classes in the kitchens in the HLC. All right, so for those of you joining us, I know that we got a few people joining us. I uh, just want to let everybody know again that we have Diana Novi from Flat Winery. Uh, she's got some really great wines, and we're just uh, going through and making a um, stuffed chicken breast with a sausage and cheese stuffing and a polenta with some fresh corn in it. Did I about cover it, Jason? 
I think that about covers it. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, what are we going to do next week, Jimmy? I, one, one week away from classes starting next week. I need to... Yeah, I think we should do some uh, some college cooking, some uh, you know, freshman cooking for those of you who uh, may be moving into an apartment or something when you only have a one pot, one burner, and a microwave. Maybe um, grilled cheese and tomato soup with some fresh tomatoes. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, everybody's fresh tomatoes food. are coming in right now. Awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. They're just turning the right color. Like your grapes you were just saying, Diana, you were in the uh, in the field earlier. It's the same season. Yeah, grapes look like harvest is about 45 days out because uh, verasion is pretty much complete in the vineyard. <laughs> awesome. So and for those exciting stuff. For those out there that don't know what verasion is, can you can you explain that a little bit? Yes, this is when the grapes uh, basically uh, start taking start changing color, take on sugar, they soften up. This is when they start to taste good, <laughs> and yeah. this is this is that turning point from unripe fruit to ripe fruit. And you said as it so, changes color, it, you got to cover it with nets to keep the birds out, right? Because it looks delicious to them yeah, too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, depending on where the vineyard is, and um, there's one section of this vineyard that I buy grapes from. It's in the Sonoma Coast, a little town called Occidental. There is a, a, a telephone wire that runs alongside the vineyard, and the birds like to perch on that. <laughs> yeah, they're just they're watching, and as soon as you leave the vineyard, they start diving in, and <laughs> they'll eat fruit. So the grower has nets that he will pull up, wrap around the, the grapevines, and, you know, they're probably half-inch squares on the nets, so you can still get in there. You can reach in with a pair of needle nose uh, uh, clippers and pull a sample, you know, to test sugars and things. Um, but the birds can't sit on the wire or anything. They can't get they can't get their balance okay. to get in there and still get just enough to the berries. So right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> just to inconvenience well, them. Protect your crops, you know. Yeah, and the sunlight still gets through. The breeze can blow through it, so it, it doesn't you know damper at all the ripening process. So right. it works out well. Yeah, this is such an exciting time of year. I mean, absolutely my favorite. <laughs> I, bet, I bet it's so nice to go out there into the uh, into the field and just kind of see the potential growing out there. Right. And so today I would say that, you know, the vineyard was fully colored up. So probably in two weeks I'll go out and take my first um, sample for sugars and flavors. And then I'll start tracking those. And just watching the weather and see how things are moving along. And probably by mid to late September, I should be harvesting. Oh, so nice. that's super exciting. Um, but first I have a little more bottling to do. We yeah. <laughs> have to bottle, so I have all my barrels empty, ready to go. <laughs> and so what are you bottling right now? Uh, so I bottled my Pinot Noir uh, about two weeks ago, and I'm going to bottle the sparkling wine on August 14th. I will be having my next release um, offering on all three wines. So it's two Pinot Noirs and one sparkling wine. I'll be releasing probably late September, shipping out by the end of October. So definitely in time for everybody to stock up for the holidays. Very cool. Now you said that this is the... Uh... The first Pinot, the first still wine um, from Flaunt, correct? That's right, yeah. So when I started Flaunt Wine Company, it was going to only be a sparkling wine brand. That's initially <laughs> what I was thinking. Uh, for 25 years before I started Flaunt, I was co-winemaker and co-owner of Siduri Winery, and I specialized in Pinot Noir. And I was producing up to 30 different Pinot Noirs by the time I sold the winery. Um, but Pinot Noir is definitely something I know very well. It is in my blood, so to speak. I absolutely enjoy everything that the wine is. And I enjoy the climates where the wine grows. It grows in very cold climates. And that just speaks to my soul and to who I am as a winemaker. 
So uh, the sparkling wine has been a true joy to make, um, but I was missing where my true comfort level is, which is Pinot Noir. <laughs> so I decided to start making that again. Um, so Flaunt, I started in 2017 after selling the winery Siduri and Novi Family Wines in 2015 um, at Siduri and Novi. I was co-owner and co-winemaker with my then husband. Um, since selling the winery, um, I'm now a single lady, and <laughs> I thought Flaunt was definitely the most fitting name um, for, for my brand going forward. I still have um, all the support in the world from my ex-husband. He and I are great friends, and we have three children together. <laughs> so well, everything is, is great there. Um, but it's been an exciting for me to be making a name for myself on my own with Flaunt. So that's what Flaunt is about. It's just me showing off and doing my thing um, myself and having fun. Cool, yeah, and I'm, I'm really excited. I, as soon as that Pinot comes out, I think we'll order a couple bottles and get them out here to Colorado so we can taste them here. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> Absolutely. It'd be wonderful. All right, Jason, how are you looking on that chicken? And where are we at now? So chicken's got about another two or three minutes here, so I'll go ahead and finish up this uh, this polenta here. So we've got really nice, kind of deep, rich, not rich, but kind of a deep yellow color here. So we're gonna kind of lighten that up a little bit. We'll take our, our corn cream here and add probably about one cup or so here of it, and we'll just stir that in, kind of help loosen it up too a little bit. Um, you know, what I was seen. I had never seen anybody using the corn cob like you did. I thought that was really interesting. And you can also make corn stock with it too, You're cleaning a bunch of corn and then cook it in water. And, uh, you can make a corn stock then as well and cook your rice or risotto or whatever with it. So we'll add a little bit more of the corn cream there, but it's really lightened up quite a bit here. And so you, you're kind of using that to control the consistency of the polenta too, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, with that fat in there, the, the fat really kind of relaxes it a little bit, um, makes it creamier. Um, you know, it's, a lot of times you see in restaurants, they, they do finish their risotto with, with butter. Um, they're supposed to do that. But that's what gives you know, a lot of restaurant-style risotto that's creamy. This is the, the butter, and of course, the cheese that's in there, too. Um, but it's just that fat content from the heavy cream, and we reduce that a little bit, and then that adds the nice creaminess to it. There, so got the nice little creaminess there. That's good. See, this is what always happens. You, you start finishing everything, and then I get hungry. At least I do have a glass yeah, of wine. Right? After all those audio issues, I think I needed that. <laughs> good. You handled it well. <laughs> all right, so. We'll... Throw in some of that there. Just for some extra love here, I'm going to throw in a number two of butter. Why not? Yeah, a little extra butter. Never hurt. Yeah. I don't know about you, when I used to work in a commercial kitchen, I always kept uh, some cubed butter just in the fridge right below, just in case I needed it. Just add a little okay. extra fat, and I would just take like a tiny little cube, which was a quarter, um, maybe five grams of butter, and just throw it in there. And uh, it's kind of one of those oh, yeah. uh, those restaurant tips that we all use just to get that that really rich, unctuous flavor and finish off a sauce or finish off a, a starch or something. Yeah. Oh. And is it unsalted butter? Yep. It is, yeah. I always use unsalted butter. Okay. That is definitely... Uh... Yeah, we like to control the amount of salt. And if you keep just using butter, yep. salted butter, then it just gets too salty sometimes. Right. You can have a little more control right, over so fat versus salt. We're going to pull down our chicken breast now, so we're good to go on that. So, um, you know, with this cream, with this corn plenty, you could add um, a lot of different herbs. If you wanted to add some parsley, you could do that. Um, of course, basil and corn go together really well. Um, I'm not going to put a whole lot into it, though, because I don't want a strong basil flavor. Uh, just a little, little hint of it there. So we'll take some... There's basil here, and uh, 
hold that thyme and then this basil and I've got some parsley here too that went into the stuffing. All those came from, came from the garden this afternoon. So that's, that's always fun. I love being able to do that, walk out to the garden. Yeah, it's, it's nice uh, to have everything right, to right outside. Yeah, definitely. And so many people, you know, planted the gardens now because of COVID, which has been nice. Yeah, yep, we actually did a oh, yeah. video on COVID gardens. Um, Chef Jackson <laughs> Lamb, um, if anybody's looking for it, there's a video on YouTube. Um, he actually goes through for our Urban Ag class. We posted these videos up for everybody, uh, but it was for our Urban Ag class. And he goes through the process of how to um, plan your garden, where to plant things, um, anticipation of a hailstorm, because we had a, a scare with some uh, storms coming up. So. He, he's got a video on how to get everything covered and you know, just runs through the whole thing of uh, urban gardening and urban farming. So it's a cool little series if you want to check that out on YouTube. Yeah, definitely. That's always fun. You can start a garden and then harvest everything later on. That's great. So. Yeah, everybody else has a okay, COVID so gardens. I have a COVID basement. I'm uh, working on finishing my basement downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot of a lot of house projects too probably happen right now. Yeah, I did a lot of rearranging. I got rid of my dining room furniture because we just eat in the kitchen, the family room here. So I turned my dining room into my office. I moved the office out of the bedroom, and now my office is in the middle of the TV room. The kids are in there a lot, and it's just a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what do we got there? We got some fresh. Greens. Right, so here I've got um, so here I've got some uh, mustard greens here. So what I did is I chopped them up. They were pretty dirty today, so I washed them in a in a in a bowl a couple of times, and then I pulled out yet another favorite kitchen tool, a little <laughs> salad spinner here. I love this thing; it's great. Um, and then of course, you know, that's how much liquid you get out from yeah. Um, after washing it there, so. You know, it, see, it these seems absurd are, to get oh, a solid spinner because it takes up so much space or anything, but they're really actually yeah. effective at what they do. And, you know, it's one of those things that is worthy of having the cabinet space taken up in your uh, kitchen. Yeah, definitely, definitely. All right, so we're going to throw these in. We're going to put a little bit of oil here, maybe a tablespoon of oil in here. It's going to crack on the top of the bottom. Is that civil? All right, and we'll throw some salt and pepper in here, a little bit there. Oh man, I love that smell. Yum. Stir that up just a bit. I do love mustard greens. Now, I see some bacon in the screen. Is that going to be for the mustard greens? Well, that was just in case. Just in case. I think bacon belongs in mustard greens all the time. <laughs> right, we'll put some bacon in the, at the very end there. We'll have that nice, kind of that bitterness kind of thing there to kind of go with all of this, all this richness and stuff in here. I like so. that you just have bacon just in case. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing that a lot too during quarantine. <laughs> it's just really good. <laughs> yep. Uh, Occasionally, I'll have a bag of extra bacon just sitting in there, like, oh, this looks like a good snack. <laughs> throw, our, throw our bacon in here. Probably good there. Throw off our heat. Give me a towel for my fingers. There we go. All right. I've been using mustard greens a lot too, cooking them, and I never really had before. Um, but I like them in quiche. Oh, nice! I like mustard greens and, and leeks with Gruyere. So good. Oh, that, sounds, <laughs> that sounds really good. That does sound great. Okay, so now, what kind of morning wine do you have with that quiche? A uh, sparkling wine with yep. that. <laughs> oh, see, I think I think sparkling wines. Are really good anytime. <laughs> yeah, honestly, they, are. they go with everything, yeah. I think. I've, I've gone to a wine dinner before. It was at Chandon. It was one of their big anniversary dinners. And the entire dinner with, with sparkling wine, and we had venison as our main Ooh, course. Really? 
Oh. It was different sparkling wines, vintage sparkling wines, uh, Brut Rosés, um, you know, late Disgorge. So there was all different levels of complexities with the wines. And it was incredible, this entire meal. And it opened my eyes, you know, to what sparkling wine could be with food. And that was about 20 years ago. And, you know, I also had a trip to Champagne and got to try a lot of great wines there, of course. But it's been a dream of mine for a long time to make sparkling. So I'm happy I'm finally living that dream. Yeah, no, that's great. And I, I saw that, yeah, your wine, your wine got 90 points, right? Yeah, yes. That's yeah. awesome. Congrats on that. <laughs> yeah, it's, thank you very much. It is, it's, I don't expect great reviews, but it sure is nice when they happen. <laughs> Now, again, while we're having audio issues, I heard you two talking a little bit about, um, you know, life as a winemaker during quarantine. Um, right. What is that like? Are you wearing a mask out in the field or just like around people? Um, yeah, so in the field, definitely everyone is social distancing. Um, I, you know, I was out there today with my son, and every time that I've gone out there, um, there haven't been other people there. So I go through and... I take videos of the work that I'm doing, what I see needs to be done, and then I send that to my grower and I ask him, you know, to have the crew go out there and do what needs to be done. And um, honestly, there's not much that I ever have to ask for because my grower is on top of things <laughs> incredibly well. I've been working with him for a long time. Um, but the crew goes out and you know, they're on different rows, they're spread out, so they are social distancing. Um, and at the winery, uh, definitely we wear masks um, there. So I make my wine at a custom crush facility, and I'm not the only winemaker working there. Um, so we, we wear a mask. We keep we make appointments to come in. Also, we schedule who's going to come in on what days, and um, also when customers want to come in to taste. Um, right now, because of the stage of opening that a reopening that California is in and it has been changing. Um, but right now we're only doing tastings outdoors, but that's a lot of fun to come out to wine country and to sit at a picnic table and taste wines, you know, with the vineyard and a garden yeah, <laughs> surrounding it seems you. seems like you're kind so. of set up for I mean, the social distance piece. Uh, you know, a lot of restaurants here in Denver, um, we've opened up streets or closed down streets and opened them up to restaurants to allow them to have a little yeah. bit more alfresca dining. And uh, yeah. in California and Napa Valley and Sonoma and everywhere, it seems like you're already set up for that. So it's kind of nice. We are, and we have the weather for it yeah. too. Yeah. So it's really ideal. Yeah, for us, it's yeah. about the storm over here. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we're very lucky with that. So, you know, there aren't as many visitors right now because people aren't traveling, but honestly, it's a fantastic time to come out because of that. You're going to get a lot of attention. We are very excited to see people <laughs> pull up. It's appointment only, but um, yeah, that, that's how most wineries are anyway, yeah, normally. Yeah. So make yeah. an appointment, come sit outside with, you know, a lot of times, especially this summer, you actually get to talk to the winemaker because we don't have much else going on. <laughs> So, yeah, th things are um, slow, but moving along, and it's about to get busy and be business as usual once harvest starts. So, yeah, but I imagine um, with harvest, when we're, you know, standing at the sorting table, picking through our grapes, deciding what, you know, goes into the fermenters, we'll be wearing masks while yeah. we do that and, you know, washing our hands often, but we'll get through yeah. it. And we'll make wine. It has to and be made. Also, so what's kind of cool about all this is, you know, we have to be a little bit more intentional about what we are doing, you know, and so making an appointment to go to a winery, um, then you get a really great experience, you know, and I think, <clears throat> I think as people start to do things, get out a little bit more, still do things safely, um, you're going to start to see, I think we're going to have some really cool experiences that come with that, you know, um, and, you know, people, I think people will be willing to pay more for those, that, that experience even. Um, and you know, I, I've, I've been out a few times, like we took a, a small road trip up to Idaho and some of the national monuments that we went to, there was nobody there, but so it was great cause it was okay. nice and distant. Like we didn't have to worry about crowds. We got a private tour with right. a park ranger. Um, everybody's masked up, but 
we're outside and he, he took my daughter and my son and we got to go see fossils and like things that we wouldn't have been able to do if there were huge crowds. Now I know we need to, uh, um, yeah. economically though, the huge crowds are what really drive everything. So, you know, I think we'll come to a good balance, um, at the end of all this. And I have, I have faith in society that, uh, we can find that balance. I hope so. I'm thankful in the meantime that people are still drinking. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jason, looks like you're All ready. Right, let me go ahead. All right, so yeah, plate there. Yeah, there we go. All right, so we'll just take a little scoop of our uh, polenta here and right in, put it right in the middle of our plate there. A little more. All right, and we'll take a little bit of our mustard greens and bacon here. We'll kind of put those right in the middle like so. All right, and we'll take our stuffed chicken breast here. and You can cut it, you know, straight down if you wanted to. It kind of makes a uh, kind of a wow factor. Right there for something looks a little bit nicer here. We can do something like this. I'll take that guy. Yep. Nice. Cut on the diagonal on the bias so you can see the inside. There, and now we can see all of our all of our different food elements there. Let's take our vinaigrette here and kind of drizzle on top like so. You know, it's not exactly restaurant quality, but hey. But hey, we did it in under an hour, pretty, right? Yeah, right. you know, I think that's a pretty good little meal there to serve with, serve with a, a flaunt sparkling wine. It looks wonderful, Jason. I'm jealous. Right? See, this is the problem. <laughs> I, I, I'm always so hungry at the end of this. <laughs> uh, yeah, but... So. Oh, there goes your computer. <laughs> yeah, there's my ceiling. Sorry about that. All right. I got a stack, a stack of books there. So, all right. So for today, we did um, a gorgonzola cheese with uh, sausage stuffed uh, chicken breast, right? Um, made up a little bit of uh, uh, corn, corn cream polenta, uh, some sauteed greens, added bacon at the end there, um, and an apple thyme vinaigrette with bacon as well. Emergency so, bacon. Uh, <laughs> what's that? Emergency on the side bacon, just in case. <laughs> bacon, always keep that. Always keep bacon. Uh, garlic cream wraps. I don't, you never know what you're going to do. Uh, and then, of course, we had a very special uh, and wonderful guest there with, uh, from, from, from Flaunt there and uh, talking to us about our cooking wine. So thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, Good. my pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> That's great. I can't, uh, you know, I was, I was looking up the wine last night to see if maybe we can get it overnight or something like that, but no such luck. It, we'll have to, we'll, we'll, we'll have, I'll have to wait a couple of days for it. But, uh, but uh, yeah, definitely want to bring some of that in and uh, definitely want to uh, taste that wine. So. Well, good. I'll be in touch with you guys on how to make that happen. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, on that note, absolutely. Yeah, I got a glass. Diana, you have a glass. Jason, I don't know if you have glass, but you have food. All right. We're here. Sorry. Well, cheers. Great. But and. Cheers, Cheers again. Thank you for joining us, Diana. And uh, of course, thank you, everybody else out there, for joining us. And uh, sorry for the audio issues. We'll make sure to get that taken care of. We may re record some of this, maybe a little intro or something, and put it out there for you. But thanks for hanging in there with us. Have a great night. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Diana. Truly appreciate your time. Of course. <laughs>